The invasive silver and bighead Asian carp are two fish that are causing massive ecological destruction here in America. As those of you who are subscribers to this channel are well aware, I've made many videos and have also written a book about how to catch and cook these troublesome yet delicious and nutritious fish. Asian carp are commonly harvested with bow fishing gear by recreational fishermen, since as filter feeders who consume microscopic plankton, they typically don't strike at traditional lures or go after live or prepared baits, like most other species of freshwater fish do. That being the case, in order to catch them on a rod and reel, one has to implement alternative fishing techniques, such as snagging. Before I get too deep into talking about snagging gear, it's important to point out that snagging is not a legal method for harvesting most native species of fish, with some exceptions, such as going after paddlefish and certain species of salmon at certain times of the year on certain rivers. So before you break out your snagging rod, be absolutely certain that it's legal for the body of water that you're fishing on and for the species of fish that you're pursuing. In many locations around the country, snagging Asian carp is legal, as these fish have grown to populations that equal a biblical plague, and conservation and natural resource officials want to get as many of these fish as possible out of the water as fast as possible. Snagging is also a great alternative to bow fishing for Asian carp on overcast, rainy days, or in muddy water, as you have to be able to see the fish in order to go after them with bow fishing gear. Snagging is pretty simple, really. All you need is a stout rod, strong line, heavy weights, and a large snagging hook. In regard to rod selection, you can use a heavy-duty bait casting or spinning rod and reel setup, such as something you would use when going after big pike, salmon, or catfish, or you can use a designated snagging rod. Now much of this is a matter of personal preference, and each has its positives and negatives. There are some major differences, though, between a designated snagging rod and a more standard, heavy-action fishing rod. If you plan on snagging all day long, or at least for many hours at a time, you may want to go with a dependable, heavy action bait casting or spinning rod, which is much lighter and more manageable than using a snagging rod. Now I stress the word dependable here because I've seen low quality rods snap like twigs when snagging. Snagging is a very physical, combative style of fishing. You'll be getting a lot of exercise, and it can be hard, heavy work when done for long periods of time. Thus, using dependable, lighter gear certainly has its advantages if you plan on a full day of snagging. Designated snagging rods are typically big, heavy, thick rods that have devastating hook-setting power. Now you can certainly drive a hook home with a heavy action spinning or bait casting rod, but a snagging rod can drive a hook through a steel plate. Well, maybe not, but you get the idea. There is very little flexing action in a snagging rod, so they rarely break. To give you an idea of the weight difference, my heavy action Shakespeare Ugly Stick, along with the reel, which works great for snagging and I highly recommend, weighs in at about a half a pound. Meanwhile, my Ozark Snagger, along with the reel, weighs around three pounds. Now this may not sound like a big deal, but let me tell you, when you cast and retrieve and snag away with big heavy tackle over and over again for hours on end, along with reeling in giant powerful fish, you will definitely notice the difference by the end of the day between using a snagging rod and a more standard fishing rod. Now as far as actual snagging performance, to tell you the truth, after having fished extensively with both styles of rods, I really don't notice that big of a difference. I hook almost as many fish with my ugly stick as I do my Ozark snagger, but not quite as many. But because of the considerable weight difference, I can fish much longer without needing to take a break with my beloved ugly stick. No matter what you choose for a snagging rod, you're going to need a large capacity fishing reel and some line. Some folks prefer small diameter braided line, 
Some like heavy monofilament, and some like super strong snagging line. Again, much of this is a matter of personal preference, and it's also a matter of what size and style of fishing reel that you choose to use. If you're using a large bait caster or spinning reel that has lots of room on the spool, you can use the heavier, thicker line with no issues. But if you're using a more standard sized reel, you might want to use the smaller diameter braided line, which will allow you to get much more line on your reel than if using regular monofilament or designated snagging line. As an example, I use small diameter 60 pound braid on my ugly stick rod and reel, and Berkeley Big Game 50 pound monofilament on the relatively small Abu Garcia bait caster reel that I have on my snagging rod. I recommend that you do a little experimenting to see what kind of line works best for you and your particular gear. As far as snagging tackle, all you need is some big weights and a big treble hook. Now you can buy the weighted snagging hooks, which are a little expensive, or as most folks do, just rig up some heavy weights with a large treble hook, such as a size 10, which is much more economical. You can buy hooks and weights at local tackle shops or at places like Walmart, Bass Pro Shops, and all the other popular outdoor stores. How big and how much weight you need for your snagging rig will depend on how deep the water is that you're fishing and how strong the current is. So I like to have a variety of sizes along and then adjust accordingly. Keep in mind though that silver and big head Asian carp typically hang out in the upper area of the water column, not way down deep on the bottom. Also, they tend to congregate in slower moving, slack water areas, not out in the fast, powerful current of the main river channels. I found that two to three ounces of lead works fine in most situations to get out to where the fish are and to get down deep enough to consistently snag them. But again, this is something that you may have to experiment with to see what works best on the particular body of water that you're fishing. Regarding your snagging hooks, it's very important to keep them sharp, as they can get quite dull from bouncing off rocks and hooking fish. I recommend having a hook sharpener or a small file in your tackle box to sharpen up your hook points from time to time for optimal performance. It really is amazing how many more fish you'll catch with a sharp hook and how many more you'll lose with a dull hook, no matter what the style of fishing. If you're using a weighted snagging hook, then there's nothing else to rig up. Just tie it to the end of your line using a good strong knot like a Palomar knot and start snagging away. If you'll be using separate hooks and weights, however, which is a much more economical choice, then there are many ways that you can rig them up. Some prefer to have the weight on top or in front of the hook, and some prefer to rig up the weight behind the hook. After using both methods extensively, I found that I don't get hung up on the bottom nearly as much when rigging up with the weight behind the snagging hook. And if I do get hung up, which is quite common when snagging, I can sometimes at least get my hook back instead of losing the whole rig. As an example of both methods, when I use the weight on top rig, I'll first put an upside down bullet weight on my line, then a couple of one to one and a half ounce egg sinkers, and then tie on my hook with a polymer knot. To keep the egg sinkers from sliding around on my line, I'll peg the bullet weight in place with a toothpick, as you can see here. For the weight behind the hook rig, I'll first tie on the hook with a polymer knot, giving myself plenty of extra line to work with on the tag end, usually at least a foot. Next, you can tie the tag end of the line around the shank of the hook with a nail knot if you want to get fancy, or you can just loop it around the base and secure it with a couple of standard overhand knots. After that, just tie on the weights of your choice a good six inches or so behind the base of your hook and you're ready to go. By the way, I did a past video series about how to tie the Palomar knot, nail knot, and many others, which you can check out here at this channel. Now please keep in mind that these are just two suggested methods for setting up your snagging rig, and they are certainly not carved in stone. I'm always experimenting with other rigs and other types of tackle, and I certainly encourage you to do the same. As far as the actual snagging technique, much of it depends on the situation. When fishing from a boat or over a deep drop-off, snagging in a vertical motion is most effective. 
and when snagging from the shore or in shallower water, a horizontal motion works best. Either way, it's ideal to make long, full, sweeping snagging motions. I like to think of it as swinging a baseball bat in reverse. So after casting your rig out in the water and letting it sink to the desired depth, reel in the slack and make long, full, sweeping snag motions while reeling in the slack as fast as you can in between snags. It's very important to keep your snagging rig constantly moving throughout your retrieve. Otherwise, there's a good chance you'll get hung up on the bottom. In fact, no matter what you do, there's still a good chance that you'll get hung up often, so be sure to have plenty of hooks and weights with you. Also, be very careful when you're snagging. Whipping around several ounces of lead through the air with a giant hook and a stout rod can get you or other people hurt real bad. So be very mindful of what you're doing at all times and who's around you. As I mentioned earlier, Asian carp typically stay out of fast, powerful currents as much as they can to conserve their energy and not waste calories. This being the case, you'll most often find schools of fish hanging out in slower moving, slack water areas. You'll need to experiment with how much you let your rig sink before you start your retrieve, as well as how far you cast out in order to pinpoint the depth and the general area where the fish you're holding. But once you start catching a few fish consistently, stick with what you're doing, as there's sure to be more fish in that area. As a final tip, if you start catching a bunch of fish and then suddenly the action stops, you've most likely spooked the fish out of the area. But have no fear, they will most likely regroup or another school of fish will move in. So when the action stops or drastically slows down, take a break, sharpen your hook, and after 15 minutes or so, get back at it. Or simply move on and find another ideal spot. So there you have it my friends, that's how to fish for silver and big head Asian carp with a rod and reel using the snagging method. If you'd like to learn more about Asian carp, be sure to check out my book, Eat the Enemy, a complete guide to catching and cooking the Asian carp. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to this channel and check out the 3 Minutes Outdoors website at 3minutesoutdoors.com.